Hi, I'm Ron. Welcome to the channel. Today we're taking a little break from playing Native American flutes and making music uh, to look at more of my favorite books by Native American writers. And today it's all about nonfiction books. So whether you're into science or whether you're into literary criticism or social commentary and activism or religion and philosophy, I think I've got you covered in just seven books. So let's get started. As we move along here, I'm probably going to use the term Native American an awful lot. And uh, I'd like for you to understand that I use that in a very inclusive way. When you hear me say Native American, uh, understand that I mean all of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. This entire hemisphere is Indian country. And uh, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go along. Now, if you are a person who has read more books about Native Americans than by Native Americans, uh, it might be really helpful to begin to get some insights into our worldview because that will help you to underst understand more how we do science and, and think about community and activism and about a whole lot of other things. I think one of the most engaging places to begin to get an understanding of that is with this book, The Truth About Stories by Thomas King. Now, Thomas King is himself a great storyteller, has written uh, some contemporary classic novels as well as short stories and poems, but here he is examining the idea of story itself and suggests that really story is all that we are. Uh, the first chapter here, if you're only going to read one chapter of, of all the things that I'm recommending today, make it chapter one of this book. Uh, he will contrast uh, creation stories. Uh, Sky Woman is uh, from indigenous perspective, and I usually associate that with uh, Iroquois Confederacy people. So we're, we're talking New York and Ontario, places like that. And he contrasts that with the creation story from Genesis, the dominant culture's uh, creation story, then unpacks those a bit. You know, what are the values and the worldviews and the understandings uh, that inform these stories? And then depending on which of those stories you believe uh, your decision making and your understanding of your place in the universe and how to relate to the beings that we share the universe with, all of that will be informed by the creation story you believe. So it's a really, really wonderful place to start. It's a very engaging writing, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it a lot. Next up, we have a couple of science books. Now, there are those who would suggest that indigenous peoples have never done science, but these two writers would beg to differ. Uh, the first is Gregory Cajete, Native Science. This was published in about 2000, but I think the thinking here is extremely valuable still, uh, and I would maybe suggest that it's even kind of a, a modern cl a classic of uh, science writing. Uh, I'd like to share just a little bit from uh, near the beginning of the book that kind of gives you an idea of uh, what he's suggesting here. Native science is the collective heritage of human experience with the natural world. In its most essential form, it is a map of natural reality drawn from the experience of thousands of human generations. It has given rise to the diversity of human technologies, even to the advent of modern mechanistic science. A little bit further on, I think uh, this is a, a really important notion here, uh, talking about how Western science and indigenous sciences can be in dialogue with uh, one another. A major issue that arises is cultural bias. Some Western scientists insist that science must be objective to qualify as science, that it is culturally neutral and somehow exists outside of culture and is thus not affected by culture. The counter-argument is that nothing people do is divorced from culture, including systems of knowledge, technology, and education. So again, we're back to Thomas King's notion of uh, which creation story do you believe, because that's even going to inform how you do science, um, all aspects of it, even you know, what knowledge matters, uh, how do you gather it, uh, what do you do with it when you're done, and, and uh, who does it belong to once it's there. After Cajete lays his groundwork, he looks at a number of different aspects of indigenous science and technologies in the Americas, things like astronomy, uh, how we deal with animals, how we understand community and a sense of place, deep ecology. Uh, and one of the things I find most intriguing is plants and agriculture. 
I could run off a whole list of familiar food plants, things like corn and beans and squash, uh, tomatoes, potatoes, chilies, chocolate, pineapple. I could go on and on and on. Foods that are now familiar all around the world that were originally cultivated here in the Americas by indigenous agriculturalists. We were very, very good at plants. Um, sometimes the new people that came here didn't understand that because the way we did this did not involve clear-cutting forests and planting everything in rows. But we were very good with plants. And one of the plants that was important to us um, culturally and even ceremonially is sweetgrass. And it kind of gives a, a framework for this book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Kimmerer, uh, this is about 15 years down the road from um, from the Cajete. It was published in 2000. I think this was published in 2013, if I remember right. Kimmerer suggests that uh, Western science and indigenous science can be seen as different lenses of knowledge. And what she's calling for is looking for ways to bring those together because it will give us a fuller understanding uh, of the world and help us to move forward uh, in a way that might avoid wrecking the planet. Um, I'd like to share again just a short passage uh, from her work to give you a sense of uh, where she's coming from as well. Again, we're going to get back to this idea of worldviews and how it informs all of the ways that we relate to the world around us. We are all the product of our worldviews, even scientists who claim pure objectivity. Their predictions for sweetgrass were consistent within their Western science worldview. And she's talking here about a study that she and her students had des designed uh, to think about reintroducing sweetgrass into areas where it had disappeared. Uh, so their predictions for sweetgrass were consistent with their Western science worldview, which sets human beings outside of nature and judges their interactions with other species as largely negative. They had been schooled that the best way to protect a dwindling species was to leave it alone and keep people away. But the grassy meadows tell us that for sweet grass, human beings are part of the system, a vital part. And uh, this kind of touches on a really key word for Kimmerer, reciprocity, that uh, the world around us is not just material objects that are there for our exploitation and uh, pleasure and profit, but in fact, they are our relations. And in one of our favorite, my favorite lines from this book, she suggests that killing a who demands something very different from killing an it. So uh, again, our understanding of the world we live in and how we are to properly relate to it uh, makes a big difference, even in the way that we understand science and the way that we do science and uh, use technologies to sustain our people. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, the story the dominant culture was putting out uh, was that Native American peoples were vanishing, that soon we would all be extinct. So you better get out there and photograph them and record them, uh, even put them on exhibit uh, before they disappeared entirely. And uh, the next book comes out of that uh, experience and that thinking. In 1898, uh, there was a World's Fair in Omaha, Nebraska, and the organizers rounded up a lot of different tribal people, mostly from the western part of uh, the United States, and uh, basically brought them all together in Omaha and, in, a, in effect, kind of put them on exhibit for the tourists. There was a photographer on site who was in charge of uh, doing all the important photography for the fair, and he was given the assignment of making photographs of these people. He did some more than 500, uh, and a number of them have been collected into this volume, Beyond the Reach of Time and Change. The photographer was named Frank Reinhardt, and uh, like a lot of photographers who were doing this work at the time, he would actually travel with a bag of props. And so these uh, photographs are very, very carefully staged. Uh, sometimes the, the regalia that the people are wearing is from a, a, a culture that is not theirs. You know, so, so it's very much photo photography that is produced for consumption by the dominant culture. 
Uh, so what this is, is it has a lot of lovely reproductions of the photographs themselves, but, but really what it is about is uh, essays by contemporary Native American writers reacting to and commenting on this collection of photographs. Some of the essay writers are actually descendants of people in the photographs. So it's really, really fascinating, offers a lot of insight, at times is moving. Uh, and it is uh, organized by Simon J. Ortiz, uh, the editor, who is uh, one of my very, very favorite poets. His introductory essay alone is worth the price of the book. So uh, it's a really valuable collection on a number of levels, and I can't recommend it highly enough. In the year 2000, when Time magazine was making its lists of what they thought was important that had happened in the 20th century, they named Vine Deloria Jr. as one of the greatest religious thinkers of the 20th century. And this book is one of the main reasons why God is read. Uh, this is a book about religion and spirituality, but it doesn't read like a great theological tome. It's uh, very accessible and uh, very beautifully written, and I don't think you'll have any trouble jumping into it. I'd like to share a quote from the back cover. This is from Wilma Mankiller, who is former Principal Chief of Cherokee Nation, Oklahoma. Yay! The uh, flagship book on Native American spirituality remains Vine Deloria's God is Red. He does an outstanding job of translating complex spiritual issues into very simple truths. I think that's right on target. This book was originally published in 1973, kind of at the height of uh, American Indian movement activity. And so it actually begins with kind of a survey of the current situation circa 1970s. Uh, so it's very valuable historically uh, for that reason. But then he uh, di does a deep dive into Native American religions and Native American spirituality and uh, does a lot of time uh, contrasting that with uh, European Christianity and um, really uh, you know, highlights uh, how in a lot of ways the, the worldviews are, are not really reconcilable. You, you know, it's, it, it's difficult to be on both of those paths in, in a sense. Uh, I got the 30th anniversary edition when it came out because uh, Delory had added some new material to bring it a little uh, up to date as of uh, around 2000. And it has a wonderful foreword by Leslie Marmon Silco, who's one of my very, very favorite writers ever. And uh, so I would like to uh, share her first paragraph from her foreword. No one who reads Vine Deloria Jr.'s books remains neutral. Vine's books influenced our generation and are as important to United States cultural history as are books by Norman Mailer and Tom Wolfe. This will be appreciated by future generations when U.S. history ceases to be fabricated for the glory of the white man. What influenced me as a young writer was his defiant attitude toward the power elites, whether it be Christianity or the U.S. military. But Vine's was a special sort of defiance that depended on the warmth of Indian humor and the rule of international law, never the threat of violence. If you engage with this book, uh, you will come away with an opinion. <laughs> Most people who read Vine Deloria either vibe with him pretty deeply or have a lot of issues with him. And I think you can see with uh, by how well-thumbed uh, my copy of the book is, and by how many dog-eared pages and highlights there are, uh, you get a sense which camp I am in. Uh, but if you want a real understanding of indigenous spirituality and religion in the Americas and uh, attempts to revitalize it uh, and get out from under colonial Christianity, uh, it's a really, really good place to start. The next book will bring you right up to date on indigenous resistance here in the Americas. It is As We Have Always Done by Leanne Batasamosaic Simpson. I apologize if I mispronounced her name. I don't even pronounce my own people's language well, and this is a completely different language. Simpson is Anishinaabeg First Nations from Canada, teaches university at Manitoba. She also writes fiction and poetry and is a really fine musician, so she's got a lot going on. This is from The Dust Jacket, and will give you an idea of what she is about in this book. 
Indigenous resistance is a radical rejection of contemporary colonialism focused around refusing the dispossession of indigenous bodies and land. Simpson makes clear that the resistance's goal can no longer be cultural resurgence as a mechanism for inclusion in a multicultural mosaic. Instead, she calls for unapologetic, place-based indigenous alternatives to the destructive logics of the settler colonial state, including heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalist exploitation. Why does she want to do this? She says it very beautifully. I was thinking about what I wanted for my own great-grandchildren. It was very simple. It was very simple. Indigenous freedom. This is a deep dive book, and the language sometimes uh, gets a little bit academic and jargon filled, so it can uh, it, it can be a time consuming read, but it's very, very well worth the time, uh, especially if you want to understand where indigenous thinking is going in terms of revitalizing and reclaiming our cultures and lands. Last item today is a book about literature. It's called. Why Indigenous Literatures Matter. It's by Daniel Heath Justice. Justice is a citizen of Cherokee Nation, Oklahoma, and teaches university in Canada. He's also a very fine fiction writer. Uh, he has an epic fantasy out that's based in Cherokee mythology, and uh, we'll talk about that another time. This book is a very, very inclusive look at native literatures throughout the hemisphere. So you have writers from many, many different cultures here um, and stretching uh, all the way back to the beginning uh, with our uh, oral traditions and coming right up to uh, very young writers who are just getting published now. Uh, one of the things that he really focuses on is including a lot of women writers uh, because he feels that they are underrepresented in general discussions about native books and also a lot of 2SQ writers. For those of you who are unfamiliar, 2SQ stands for Two-Spirit Queer, and it's a, a very inclusive umbrella term for specifically indigenous LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, Justice is part of that community and, and uh, it makes a special effort to see that they are represented in the book. So it's kind of a laid out in a lifeways kind of way, I suppose. There, you know, how, how does uh, indigenous literature help us be a better human? How does it help us be better relatives? How does it help us to become better ancestors? Uh, that kind of thing. In addition to being uh, a really thorough overview and a survey, it's also a, just a great resource if you're looking to find out about a lot more Native American writers because he he quotes a lot of excerpts from just a tremendous number of writers and books along the way. And uh, then at the back, he provides a couple of uh, appendices that really, I think, are worth the price of the book all by itself. One is a bibliographic essay that uh, talks about uh, a, a lot of different things in the sources that he's used. Goes a, It's a real deep dive. It's really uh, worth a look. And then also the other one is based on a Twitter project that he did, where for an entire year, Every day on his Twitter feed, he would list a different Native American writer along with a book recommendation, something that they had written. So, uh, you know, one of uh, an appendix here is just, you know, like 360 plus different Native American writers that you can check out uh, at your convenience. So it's a uh, really well reasoned, uh, well written, and uh, it's just a wonderful resource that I think you'll find very useful and enjoyable on many levels. Well, it's time to get back to practicing flutes, so that's what I have for you this time. This is just the very tip of the iceberg of great nonfiction writing by Native American authors, so if you have a favorite that I didn't talk about today, put it in the comments section so everybody else can know about it. And if you have read something that I mentioned today, I'd love to know what you thought. I will be back in about a month with more great books by Native American writers. In the meantime, I'll be posting some more videos about Native American flute playing and music making in general. So, I hope to see you again soon.